Okay, we're going to talk about the Kennedy presidency, the early years, and that's going to be from the time that he took office until the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Cuban Missile Crisis will be its own test material and its own thing, and so we're just going to go from there. Once we get through the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, then we're going to be talking about uh, President Kennedy and civil rights, including the March on Washington, which you're familiar with, and then after that we will be into his assassination. It's my prediction that we will probably get to his assassination by Christmas and we will start with that after Christmas. The only difference between this class and the classes before is we're not going to spend as much time on the Kennedy assassination. We're going to stretch from the second semester and try to get to the present. Okay, but we were the things you're learning first semester are the same things that they've always learned first semester. Okay? Alright. Well we're going to talk about the administration of President Kennedy. Um, and we talked about Franklin Roosevelt's administration was called the New Deal. Truman, the Fair Deal. Eisenhower, Modern Republicanism. The name of the Kennedy presidency was called the New Frontier. The New Frontier is what they called the Kennedy presidency. And his administration had four objectives for the United States. These were the things he was going to base his New Frontier on. New Frontier on. Four things, four objectives that President Kennedy had for the United States in his New Frontier. Okay? So, number one, the New Frontier was going to build up the military with conventional weapons. It was Kennedy's goal to build up the United States military with conventional weapons, which are non... conventional are non-nuclear, okay? He was very, very concerned about nuclear weapons and the fact they had been used, and you saw that in the debate. And so he wants to build up the military, but he wants to build up using conventional methods, not nuclear methods, okay? So he's going to build up the military with conventional weapons. Second goal for the new frontier, and this will make sense, is he wanted to pass the Russians in the race for space. He made a prediction. He said, by the end of the decade, man will land on the moon safely and return to Earth. Everybody thought he was crazy, but it happened. It happened. Okay? Uh, where we were when he said it was we were so far away from it, it, it wasn't even realistic. And we're going to bring this will come up in his administration, the Mercury Space Program. But I mean, when he made that bold prediction, people thought he was out of his mind. So he said that we would pass the Russians in the race for space. Another thing that we've heard about before that the new frontier was going to do was provide medical care for the elderly. Medical care for the elderly. And the fourth thing we heard about is Kennedy's new frontier wanted to provide government money for education. So, President Kennedy's new frontier had four objectives for the United States. Number one, to build up the military with conventional or non-nuclear weapons. Number two, pass the Russians in the race for space. Number three, provide medical care for the elderly. And number four, provide government money for education. That was the goals of, the, the goals of his program. <laughs> Unfortunately, he's going to get some of these done but he's not going to live to see most. Okay? That then will take us to his cabinet. We're really going to go into detail on President Kennedy's cabinet. It was a very unique presidential cabinet. And we'll tell you all the key players because they're all going to play a role in this administration. Now, he had probably one of the best balanced cabinet in American history, which means he put people of different philosophies and parties and those types of things. He had a very balanced cabinet. His vice president, we should know, was Lyndon B. Johnson. And we mentioned this before, he was a, now the former Senate Majority Leader, very, very popular politician from Texas. And even though he's a Democrat, what demographic is he uh, pleasing by having Johnson in, in the cabinet? The South, okay, because he's a Northerner, he's a New Englander, right? So he's balanced that way. He's got. A vice president from the South who's very popular from the South. He's very experienced because he was the former Senate Majority Leader. They will not always get along, I will tell you that. We'll talk about that later. But it shows the good balance. The man he chose as his Secretary of State was this fellow right up here, Dean Rusk. He's on the cover of this Time magazine here. Dean Rusk. All the cabinet members are here, by the way. Dean Rusk. And you'll hear more about Dean Rusk. 
Did the door knock or not? Yeah, that was the door. Oh, hi, dear. Aurora, can you come up here and sign something here, dear? Aurora, it yeah, is. It's worth money. We'll put it on the board. Is it worth money? Oh. Oh, okay. I thought this was a parking ticket. <laughs> oh, no. But Dean Rusk was a calm, quiet Republican from Georgia. And his job prior to becoming Secretary of State is he was president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Okay, does that ring a bell? Nelson Rockefeller? Mm -hmm. Very wealthy family, the, wealth, the Rockefellers, and they had a foundation that did what? Gave to charity. And he was the president of that foundation. That would be a, that would be a pretty Republican job, so to speak, okay? <laughs> So he was a quiet, calm Republican from Georgia, and he was president of the Rockefeller Foundation prior to becoming Secretary of State. Remember, the Secretary of State helps the president with foreign affairs. The man that was chosen as Secretary of Defense was Robert S. McNamara. He's also up on the board up there, Robert S. McNamara. He was Secretary of Defense. He was a Democrat from California, and you know what his job was before he became Secretary of Defense? This might ring a bell, although it wasn't the same as the Eisenhower administration. He was the president of Ford Motor Company during the time that he was appointed Secretary of Defense. President of Ford Motor Company. Didn't Eisenhower have a guy that was president of a car dealership who said what's good for General Motors is good for the country? Yeah. You'll fight. Yeah, this guy, McNamara, will be a big success as Defense Secretary. Now, it's kind of interesting because just listen to this, you don't have to really write it down. He was named president of Ford Motor Company in 1960, early in 1960. Now, Kennedy doesn't take office until the third week of January, so he actually got named president of Ford Motor Company just prior to Kennedy asking him if he'd be Secretary of Defense. It was the first time that a non-member of the Ford family was ever president of the company. So it shows the confidence that Ford Motor Company had in McNamara, because everybody else that was president was some relation of the Ford family. He was not. But he didn't stay in that position long because he took the job as Secretary of Defense just weeks after he was named president. Okay? Turned out to be very, very good Secretary of Defense. Unfortunately for him, he would continue to serve after Kennedy's assassinated. He gets himself dug deep in the Vietnam War with Lyndon Johnson. It was very difficult. Okay? He was from California, Democrat from California. Secretary of the Treasury was a fellow by the name of C. Douglas Dillon. C. Douglas Dillon was the Secretary of the Treasury. He was a Republican from New York and very wealthy investment banker. He was a Republican from New York and was a very wealthy investment banker. Giving out give you an idea how much money he had, and this is you've got to keep in mind, kiddos, this is 1960, right? He gave $20 million to the New York Metropolitan Museum. I mean that $20 million in 1960 is a lot of money. So he this was a very wealthy guy. Okay? He was a he was a wealthy New York investment banker, a Republican, and was a very, very good choice for Secretary of the Treasury. So Kennedy has made really good choices to this point. His press secretary was a fellow by the name of Pierre Salinger. And you'll hear an awful lot about Pierre Salinger as we continue the Kennedy administration. What's the press secretary do? Who's the press secretary right now? Anybody know? Mm -hmm. Mike Huckabee's daughter, Sarah. Can't think of her last name. She's President Trump's press secretary. They always kind of make fun of her because not real polished. The Pierre Salinger was very, very well polished. He was simply an associate of the Kennedy family, and he actually later will be the campaign manager for Robert Kennedy's bid for the presidency in 1968. <coughs> he was just a very, very close Kennedy family member, and they trust him, and you want somebody that's a press secretary that's going to say things that's loyal, because that's the voice of the president to the media, right? So Pierre Salinger, good choice. Just simply an associate of the Kennedy family, and he once served as campaign manager for Robert Kennedy when he ran for president later in 1960. Kennedy's national security advisor, his national security advisor, was a fellow by the name of McGeorge Bundy. McGeorge Bundy. 
No. Big George Bundy. Wait, what was he doing? He was the National Security Advisor. He's going to be a very <coughs> crucial member during what? If he's National Security Advisor. Cuban <laughs> Missile <laughs> Crisis, yes. He was a Kennedy loyalist, again, a friend of the family. And he was a former professor and also served as dean at Harvard University. Very bright man. Okay? So he was a Kennedy loyalist. That means he was loyal to the Kennedy family, friends of the family. But he was a former professor and former dean of students at Harvard University. Very bright man. His national security advisor, Big George Bundy, a Kennedy loyalist, former professor and dean at Harvard University. Now, Kennedy's speechwriter, and you'll hear quite a bit more about him as we get into the administration, was a guy by the name of Theodore Sorensen. Theodore Sorensen was Kennedy's speechwriter. And he was with the Kennedys for a long time. He was a lawyer and a writer. He was in the inner circle of President Kennedy. He was one of his closest advisors. Um, when Kennedy was in the Senate, McGeorge Bundy was in his assistant, helped him write speeches when he was senator. He helped him write all of his speeches when he ran for president in 1960, then became the official White House speechwriter when Kennedy was elected president. You'll hear a lot about him as well, because he's going to have to write a lot of speeches, including crucial ones during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So Theodore Sorensen was Kennedy's speechwriter, a lawyer and writer. He was in the inner circle to President Kennedy. He was an assistant during Kennedy's secretary, or senatorial years. And he served as a speechwriter for him during the 1960 presidential campaign. Now, he had two CIA directors during his administration. Two directors of the CIA. First one was Alan W. Dulles. And then it turned out later to be John McComb. So he had two CIA directors. First one was Alan W. Dulles, and then he will turn to a guy by the name of John McComb. You'll be much more familiar with McComb. Uh, McCone, we'll talk about him. McCone was, uh, the, he worked under President Truman in the Department of Defense, and he replaced Dulles after Kennedy fired him after what we will learn about later in the Bay of Pigs disaster. So Kennedy will end up firing Alan Dulles after the Bay of Pigs, and he will hire John McCone, who had served in the Defense Department under President Truman. So he's going to go through two CIA directors. He's going to fire Dulles, and McCone will be crucial during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, these other three are special assistants to the President. And basically what they are they were given jobs by President Kennedy because he wanted them close to him because he, they were his closest aides. And here they are up here. You're going to see Lawrence O'Brien right here, and you're going to see Kenneth O'Donnell and David Powers. But they were given the, the titles of assistant, special assistant to the president, and I'll tell you kind of what their jobs are. We'll start with Lawrence O'Brien. This fellow right here was a special assistant to the president. And his job, I guess, is he was supposed to communicate with members of Congress for the president. In other words, if the president wanted a congressman or woman to support him or wanted to have a conversation with him but didn't want to do it himself, he would send Lawrence O'Brien to twist their arm to vote for this or to do this or do that. Lawrence O'Brien. Now, for you basketball fans, Lawrence O'Brien later, in later years, became commissioner of the National Basketball Association, the NBA. Okay, so he was commissioner of the NBA later. But his job during the Kennedy years was to communicate with members of Congress for the president. Okay, the second special assistant to the president was David Powers. Now, he is, his job title was assistant appointment secretary to President Kennedy. That means that you set up his appointments. You scheduled his day for it, right? This is who's going to see at 8. This is going to see at... 813. This is going to who you're going to go visit with at 843. He was the assistant appointments secretary. That was his that was his title. And he was a very, very close personal friend of President Kennedy. Probably Kennedy's best friend was David Powers. President Kennedy's best friend 
was David Huff. And we'll hear more about him later. And the third special assistant to the president was Kenneth O'Donnell. And he was the appointment secretary. So what did Powers do? Power was his assistant. You really think you needed two appointment secretaries? Well, maybe. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> the appointment secretary is important because you have to schedule a day. But the point of this whole thing, before I get into uh, Kenneth O'Donnell, Kenneth O'Donnell was a very, very close personal friend of Robert Kennedy and John Kennedy, probably closer to Robert than John. But they're very good friends. So both Powers, who was probably Kennedy's best friend, and O'Donnell, who was a very close friend of President Kennedy, probably a, more of a best friend of Robert Kennedy. The purpose behind these people were to help advise the President. They, that's why he had them in. And when we get into the Cuban Missile Crisis, you're going to see exactly how this works, because as Kennedy's getting tremendous pressure from all around on this issue with Russia, the people he's going to turn to are going to be Kenneth O'Donnell, Lawrence O'Brien, David Powers and someone else, which is Robert Kennedy, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now, after President Kennedy was assassinated, David Powers and Kenneth O'Donnell co-wrote a book entitled, it's up here on this big frame, Johnny, We Hardly Knew Ye, The Memoirs of John F. Kennedy. And the, it's a very popular book, and those are signatures of both. Uh, those aides and a picture of both of them with President Kennedy were very, very close. Lawrence O'Brien was close to the President, but not as close as Powers and O'Donnell. So keep that in mind. And the last significant member of Kennedy's cabinet was the Attorney General, Robert F. Kennedy. Robert F. Kennedy, Attorney General. What was the book Johnny, we hardly knew ye. Not that important to know, but I just wanted you to get the fact that they thought so much of the president that they co-authored a book after his assassination. Now the thing that was interesting about Robert Kennedy, now the Attorney General is the most powerful attorney in the United States. He advises the President of the United States on matters of law. And Robert Kennedy was selected by his brother to be Attorney General and he had basically no legal experience. He had never really served as a lawyer. Uh, he was served briefly in the Justice Department but, I mean, he had really no legal experience at all. What Robert Kennedy had done over the years is any campaign that John Kennedy ran for, the House, the Senate, the presidency, Robert Kennedy was his campaign manager through all of it, all those campaigns. He was the guy that pushed his brother through to these elections. So his job in life was being his brother's care, caretaker to a point, his brother's lookout and his brother's campaign manager. He worked tirelessly campaigning and getting the program set up so his brother could be elected to the House, the Senate, and the Presidency. Now, people were pretty critical of the choice of Robert Kennedy as Attorney General. I mean, he had very little legal experience. Now, remember, we t I think I told you this about the Kennedy wit. He said one time when he was being criticized about picking his brother, he said, I see nothing wrong with giving Robert some legal experience as Attorney General before he goes out and practices law on his own. That was his comeback, you know what I mean? His sarcastic comeback. But it was very, very evident that he had no political experience, and he put him in there for three reasons. These are the three reasons why he picked his brother to be Attorney General despite the fact that he had absolutely no legal experience, really. What would, why did he pick him? He knew he could trust him. He knew he could trust him. What was it? What are you gonna say, Joe? He knew. Well, not your cloak. He knew that John Kennedy knew that Robert would always give him an honest answer. Okay. I'll give you an example. Mr. Smith and Mr. Sanford. Well, once in a while come up to me and say, gee, I'm thinking about doing this, what do you think? Well, I like Mr. Sanford and I like Mr. Smith, but I, I like them enough that I would tell them if they were screwing up. Now, they have to decide whether they want to take my advice, but 
if Mr. Sant comes up and says, you know what, I'm thinking about dropping the girls' swimming program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, but any, yeah, but anyway, you know, I, I'm just using the, I'm just using an example. But he would say, I'm thinking about dropping the girls' swimming program. Why? Well. I'm just making this up. Well, we don't have many participants and we're not doing that well and there's a big concern about money. And my point would be, you know, you know what, Mr. Sanford, I, I get that. I think you're, you're, you're right in those endeavors. Again, it's not what I'm saying. But I think, that, I, think I wouldn't do that. I, think that. I think you're screwing up there. And I think if you go ahead and choose to do that, you might get fired because the swim parents will go crazy. Again. You know, that's the type of thing. Now, someone that wasn't honest would say, oh, go ahead. I... I think that's the greatest thing ever to try to appease Mr. Sanford because you don't want to, you want to, you don't want to, him to not like you. Whatever. Well, you want somebody in a position that assists you to be someone that'll say, "Hey, do what you want here, buddy, but you're screwing up. This is a bad move on your part, but you can live with it." That's what Bobby had. What was the third and final reason why he picked his brother? His brother. Close. His <laughs> dad. His dad told him to. Yep. His father told him to. And his father had some influence. And his father was right. His father was a pushy bugger. But you know what? He gave a lot of suggestions, but this was a good one. Robert Kennedy, despite his lack of legal experience, remained President Kennedy's closest advisor and really turned out to be a very forceful attorney general, especially during the times of civil rights. And we'll talk about that later. But he turned out to be a very effective attorney general despite the fact and the president had an ear. He listened to Bobby more than anyone. He listened to David Powers. He listened to Kenneth O'Donnell. He listened to Lawrence O'Brien. But the man that would convince him or not convince him was Bobby. Sometimes David Powers or Kenneth O'Donnell or Lawrence O'Brien would have to go to Bobby to get Bobby to convince the president maybe that he ought to think about doing that. He'd always listen to Bobby. But he listened to these four guys. They were his closest advisors without question. He trusted them, he knew they'd give an honest answer, and he had